Any fool can make a fortune. It takes a man of brains to hold on to it. Cornelius Commodore Vanderbilt The Vanderbilts were the epitome of Gilded Age grandeur, renowned for their extravagant estates, extravagant soirees, and vibrant personalities, solidifying their status as the era's iconic family. Commodore Vanderbilt's net worth is estimated to have been equal to $185 billion at the time of his death in 1877. Yet this glittering facade belied a staggering truth by the 1970s, not a single one of the 120. Vanderbilt heirs was a millionaire. The once towering Vanderbilt empire, equivalent to the wealth of modern tech moguls, had crumbled to dust. What led to this astonishing reversal of fortune? How did a family once synonymous with endless wealth become a textbook example of financial dissipation? Join us on a journey through time as we uncover the secrets and stories behind the Vanderbilt dynasty's spectacular rise and fall. Discover the decisions, the dramas, and the dynastic disputes that turned one of the world's greatest fortunes into mere echoes of opulence. The Vanderbilt Empire traces its roots back to a humble beginning aboard a family boat, a small schooner ferrying farm produce from Staten Island to Manhattan at the turn of the 19th century. The Vanderbilts, initially part of a community of farmers and merchants descended from New York's Dutch settlers, held modest holdings, primarily the land for their farm and the family boat. Young Cornelius Vanderbilt, assisting his father since the age of 11 after leaving school, showcased a natural aptitude for business. Despite his father's limited business acumen, Cornelius's mother, a sharp and pragmatic woman, safeguarded the family farm from foreclosure, enabling Vanderbilt to embark on ventures that would define the family's future. Vanderbilt's entry into the transportation industry marked the genesis of the Vanderbilt legacy. At 16, armed with a loan from his mother, he acquired a boat and transformed it into a freight and passenger ferry, navigating the challenging waters between Staten Island and Manhattan. Vanderbilt's strategic maneuvers during the War of 1812 where he exploited his boat to move supplies for the British military while smuggling goods back into the city, illustrated his resourcefulness. These endeavors allowed him to double his revenue and expand his fleet, setting the stage for his ascendancy. Vanderbilt's prowess as a captain and businessman continued to grow, leading him to run a steamboat between New York and New Jersey after the war. However, Vanderbilt's entry into interstate steamboat travel challenged existing monopolies, prompting legal complexities. Undeterred, he partnered with businessman Thomas Gibbons to break the monopoly, showcasing Vanderbilt's role as a cutthroat manager. Vanderbilt's success extended beyond the maritime domain, encompassing diverse ventures such as operating an inn in New Jersey. As the steamboat monopoly crumbled, Vanderbilt seized opportunities, solidifying his position in the industry. Vanderbilt's strategic alliances, including a secret partnership with steamboat operator Daniel Drew, contributed to his dominance in the lower Hudson River region. Cornelius Vanderbilt's major career move was transitioning from steamboats to railways in the early 1860s. By 1870, he dominated the railway industry, highlighted by acquiring the New York Central Railroad and building Grand Central Terminal. Today, a statue of him stands outside Grand Central Terminal, commemorating his influential role in shaping the American railway system. Vanderbilt, renowned for his insatiable appetite for business expansion, didn't merely consolidate his gains, but continued to bloat his empire outward. After diversifying into New York City real estate and acquiring the Staten Island Ferry, Vanderbilt's ambitions turned towards locking down the American Northeast with more steam lines and railroads. By 1846, he had amassed millionaire status, prompting a southward gaze toward Nicaragua. Vanderbilt further solidified his influence by forming the Accessory Transit Company, regulating transit through the region. Vanderbilt's ventures extended beyond gold rush prosperity as he eyed Nicaragua's potential for a transcontinental canal. Despite selling his steamships in 1853 and stepping down as president of the Accessory Transit Company, he maintained a strategic hold on Nicaragua's transit services. Encountering financial disputes with subsequent owners, Vanderbilt, true to form, formed another steamship line to undercut competition. In the later 1850s, Vanderbilt shifted focus across the Atlantic, initiating a line of transatlantic steamships to continental Europe. Competing with the Collins Line, he successfully forced them out of business. Vanderbilt's empire, diverse and resilient, allowed him to sustain ventures operating at a loss while drawing profits from numerous others. His strategic acquisitions, including ironworks and a shipyard, 
enabled him to build his own steamships. Amid geopolitical changes in Nicaragua and the Walker Affair, Vanderbilt adapted, initiating a new steamship line to California from Panama. As seas fell under his control, Vanderbilt redirected attention to the rails, taking control of the New York and Harlem Railway in 1863. Leveraging the railroad's de facto monopoly, Vanderbilt transformed it into a profitable venture, marking a shift from steamship to railroad dominance for the Vanderbilt family by 1864. During the Civil War years, Cornelius Vanderbilt endeared himself to the U.S. government by contributing his largest steamship and supporting Union efforts. Despite facing the tragic loss of his youngest son, George Washington Vanderbilt, his business ventures proved resilient enough to survive the conflict. As the war wore on, Vanderbilt aggressively bought up railroads, consolidating major lines into some of the first American major corporations. In a year-long industry, battle for control of the Erie Railroad, Vanderbilt, although narrowly defeated, accepted a substantial sum in exchange for admitting defeat. In 1871, he completed the Grand Central train station in Manhattan, and two years later, he inaugurated the country's first continuous rail service from New York to Chicago. As Cornelius Vanderbilt grew older, he had a brief philanthropic period, contributing to job creation through the construction of Grand Central and endowing a university founded in his name. Four years after opening the New York to Chicago rail line, Vanderbilt succumbed to a prolonged illness, leaving behind a net worth of $100 million, which equals to approximately $185 billion today. At his death, he held the largest share of the country's wealth. The question of what to do with Vanderbilt's fortune arose. Not all his children had fallen into favor with him, notably Cornelius Jeremiah, a gambler and poor businessman. Vanderbilt's disdain extended to his daughters, treating them with contempt, and he ultimately settled on William H. Vanderbilt, known as Billy, as his heir. Despite being nicknamed the blockhead by his father, Billy inherited the majority of the family fortune, leading to divisive issues among Vanderbilt's children. Cornelius Jeremiah even contested the will, alleging impersonation to tarnish his reputation. The inheritance left to each sibling was dwarfed by Billy's share and the endowments for Billy's four sons. The contentious issue spurred some of Vanderbilt's daughters, Ethelinda and Mary, to fund their own college education. Cornelius Jeremiah, one of Vanderbilt's sons, took his own life in the following years. While Billy did settle with his sisters, granting them more money than initially bequeathed, the Vanderbilt siblings received only a small share compared to their expectations. Billy Vanderbilt, to his credit, doubled the family fortune over time, carefully maintaining it during the opulence and excesses of the Gilded Age. The family indulged in extravagant displays of wealth, investing in massive mansions, and participating in the cultural scenes of celebrity and aristocracy in New York. Billy Vanderbilt, however, mostly oversaw the existing empire, delegating the responsibility of running the company to industry experts while keeping his sons as board chairman to oversee them. Billy Vanderbilt was a philanthropist and art enthusiast, but his tenure as the second Vanderbilt patriarch was relatively uneventful. He passed away in 1885 at the age of 64. Upon Billy's death, his two eldest sons, Cornelius II and William Kissam Vanderbilt, inherited the vast majority of the family fortune. Cornelius II took control of the New York Central Railroad system and continued his father's philanthropic habits while actively overseeing the New York railroads. However, Cornelius II died within seven years, passing control to his brother, William Kissam Vanderbilt. William, known as Willie, was more interested in horse racing and building chateaus in France than in managing the Vanderbilt fortune. His lavish spending, combined with the cost of a difficult divorce, led to a rapid diminishment of the family wealth. Alfred, the younger son of Billy Vanderbilt, was more dedicated to business but tragically died in the sinking of the RMS Lusitania during World War I. Alfred's fortune passed to his descendants. As the family wealth continued to diminish, more Vanderbilt descendants used their remaining wealth for immediate pursuits, investing in mansions, sporting ventures, and various other activities. While some family members achieved success in the 20th and 21st centuries, the Vanderbilt family no longer maintained its status among America's mega-rich families. According to Michael McGair, a professor of history at Indiana University and author of a forthcoming biography of the Vanderbilt family, that's one of the misconceptions about the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts really didn't fail in business, they failed as a family. The decline of the Vanderbilt family can be attributed to various factors. 
One significant aspect was the diminishing number of heirs. The pressure of constantly proving one's aristocratic and dominant business status took a toll on the family. Not all members were able to cope with this pressure, leading to dissatisfaction, particularly among the males. Divorces within the family also contributed to the decline. Cornelius II and his brother William both experienced divorces, with William's wife Alva acquiring the Marble House. The subsequent generations faced even more tumultuous marital histories. Cornelius's grandson, Cornelius Vanderbilt IV, had seven marriages, while Gloria, Vanderbilt Cooper, a famous fashion designer and writer, had four husbands and relationships with notable figures like Marlon Brando, Frank Sinatra, and Roald Dahl. These high-profile divorces and relationships were scandalous, and divorce became known as the Vanderbilt Curse. The Vanderbilt's dysfunctionality and their inability to live up to the aristocratic ideal of being superior to others contributed to their loss of status. As the family faced internal conflicts and rejected common societal expectations, their decline paralleled the waning of their once powerful business empire. Ultimately, like the railways they managed, the Vanderbilt family ran out of puff, signifying the end of an era for this prominent American dynasty. By 1973, during a family reunion, not one Vanderbilt member was a millionaire, marking the decline of the family business empire within 30 years of Cornelius Vanderbilt's death. If the Vanderbilt saga has captured your imagination, imagine what more lies in the uncharted territories of business history and power dynamics. Like this video, subscribe to our channel now, and join a community to further delve into the depths of business, money, and power. Thank you for being part of our exploration into the rise and fall of the Vanderbilt Empire.